and then we'll get into our, our message for today. Father, we do thank you, Lord, and praise you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege we have to be in your house, Lord. And I just pray today as we go forward with this service that everything that's said and done will be for your honor and for your glory. Father, you've already blessed us with some beautiful singing, and we just pray, Lord, that it would help to prepare our hearts for the message. I pray, Lord, today for uh, our community as we continue, Lord, to deal with the loss of uh, Officer Wenham and uh, the police departments, Lord, and our first responders. Uh, Lord, they put yourself uh, on their line each and every day, Lord, to protect us. And we're thankful for them. We pray, Lord, you continue to bless them and continue to serve them. And know, Lord, that our community stands behind them. Father, we pray for those here in our congregation and also this lost loved ones that you would continue to bless and, and give that peace that passes all understanding that only can come from you. And we pray for those, Lord, that have, uh, are having procedures and have had procedures and are recovering. And we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless and, and uh, meet their needs as well. So again, Father, as we go through this service, I thank you, Lord, and I praise you. And we'll ask uh, today everything in Christ's name. Amen. In your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to continue um, this sermon series that I started several weeks ago, uh, Jesus Speaks from the Cross. And we'll finish it out on Palm Sunday. And uh, Jesus had seven sayings or seven words that he used from the cross, and we've looked at three of them. And this morning we're going to look at the fourth one. And probably out of the four, uh, probably the saddest one, of all of those uh, sayings that was uttered from the cross. But in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 34, it says that they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elah, Elah, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elijah. And the straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Jesus, when he died, cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. Let's pray again. Father, again today we are eternally thankful for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your living word that we have before us today. And I pray, Lord, today that this message will speak to hearts. I pray as we go forward through this message that the focus, Lord, is off of me and it's on you. It's on your precious word and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, today that Christian hearts here will be challenged. And I pray that there be anyone here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, today, Lord, would be a great day for them to accept Christ and begin a new life serving you. Father, we ask it in your precious name. Amen. So as I said, we continue in this message, and, and what I believe out of this message is literally uh, the, the saddest of all the statements. If y'all want to follow, I'm going to take my jacket on. The saddest of all these statements from the cross is this one. And... I thought about as I was preparing this message and has our communities been in a, a, a week or more of sadness and, and mourning and really confusion and we can look back through our lives and we can see many times where we can remember things that just stand out to us as just sad times and awful times. But I think as we grow forward as a community we'll remember, look back not just at this uh, officer's life and what an impact he had on his community but we'll look back to this day as a sad 
in a dark hour uh, in our county, in our community. And then on a national level, we look back on many things and we can look back uh, maybe at, at D-Day or Pearl Harbor. We look back when JFK was assassinated. Some of you sitting here in the congregation today may remember that day very clear. I don't, I was not born, but I've talked to people who, who were and they say they remember it just as clear as could be. And then the same way with Martin Luther King, you may remember the day that he was assassinated. Uh, getting a little closer to, to my realm when uh, Princess Diana had a tragic car wreck and died. We remember those things. And then, of course, I think all of us sitting here, most all except for the kids, remember 9-11 and that tragic day that happened. And I could keep going on list after list of things. But none of these things compare to the sadness that took place this day that I'm describing. This day when this darkness came up upon the earth and Jesus hung and was on the cross and ready to die. And uh, he uttered these words. Uh, in an instance here, we see that Jesus is speaking as a man because he, he cries out and he says, my God, my God. And he's acknowledging that he came to this earth to become flesh, to dwell among us. And he referred to God as God. He didn't refer to him as his father. We refer to God as God, our father. But it, God, Jesus can look to God and say that he is his true father, his physical father, not only as his spiritual father. But here we see the, the human side of Christ. And we see that everybody has a breaking point. And many of you over the past year may have been close to reaching that breaking point. Throughout uh, these sad times, we'll see, I think we'll look back and, and look at this cloud that's been hanging over our country of COVID as another sad and a dark time. It didn't just last a day or a week. It's lasted literally a year. We're coming up on it one year. And I'm thankful uh, that we've seen some positive results and the numbers are going down. And, uh, you know, we can say what we want to. I, I know it's serious and I know it's real, but I believe it's been blown a lot out of proportion in many ways to try to keep, um, put fear in people's hearts and minds and keep Christians from, from being in church. And I believe I'm thankful today that we're here. But at each and every one of us, we have that, that, that limit, that pain threshold. And for some of you, uh, it's probably stronger than others. And I'll probably admit to you, Rachel's back in the room with the, the sound equipment, but she can shake her head that I'm probably a big baby, that I, I don't have a very good pain tolerance. And I might play on that a little bit. My pain tolerance is probably a little better than it really is, but I just want to be baby sometimes. Huh? It's like William's back there pointing to himself. We, we know if we, if we complain a little bit, we might get a little extra food or something special, a little cake or a pie that we normally don't get. But all of us have that pain threshold. And here we see that Jesus, I believe, was close to reaching that limit. Sometimes if you experience a, a very severe accident, you, your body goes into a state of delirium, literally where you're just in shock. And that's your body's way of, of defending off what has happened. But here, as Christ was, was close to death, he utters out these words. And they're words that were familiar to those that were there that were listening. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Verse number 1. And this is David as he cries out. And we know that David had a, a life, if you study out the life of David, uh, it was a lot of ups and downs, a lot of highs and lows. Uh, and David was a man after God's own heart, but he was also a man that sinned as well. And he had many dark times in his life. And I believe he's, he's right here, this psalm, uh, in one of those dark times. And he says in verse number one, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says, Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? He goes on in verse two and he says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. You know, many of us today could could feel that same way that, that David does. That maybe we think that in these dark times, in these, in these sad times, that, that God is not close to us, or he's not near to us. And David cries out and even says that, you know, in the morning, in the daytime, he, and even in the nighttime. But I can promise you, we can go through these verses today, and I want to point out a few things that we can be assured, that even though God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son, that he is there for us. He is there for us. He'll never leave us or will he never forsake us. So the first point I want to make today is just that, that God never forsakes us. He never forsakes us. You know, all throughout his word, he refers to us as sheep. 
And if anybody here has any uh, experience with sheep, sheep are not a very smart animal. So I don't know if God's looking down at us and, and kind of comparing that to us. And, and sheep like to stay together. They like to be in a flock. And that's what you've heard that old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And that is the case whether it's good or bad. And I think that as Christians, that's why we've, we've longed for these past many months where we've had to meet in the parking lot or do other alternative ways of service because we want to be together. We want to flock together. God's people wants to be together. And that shows that we have God in our heart that we want to be together. But he refers to us as sheep. And sheep need a caretaker. They need somebody to take care of. And, and David, in that psalm, uh, in, the, in the 23rd psalm, the next one after the one that I had just read, when he says that, that the Lord is our shepherd. And he goes through those things. And that's not my message this morning, but I'll point out just a few of them. We, we have a God who, who leads us beside still waters. He provides for our needs. And then he makes us to lie down in the green pastures. And many times we might look at the pasture and think, that, boy, it's not, it's not as green as I would like for it to be. But it's where God would have you at. It's where God would have you in that specific time, that specific place. And there he takes us and he leads us beside these still waters and he makes us to lie down in the green pastures. And then he keeps an eye out over us. He watches us. He guards us. And that's what these shepherds did uh, in biblical times. They were responsible for this flock of sheep. And in, in our eyes today, maybe they're not as much value as put on that flock of animals or that herd of animals as it is today. But it was their possessions. It's what they had. It was what their livelihood was. And they just didn't take them out to the pasture and leave them and turn them loose and, and turn on the, the electric fence and, and let them stay in there. They didn't have all those things. They had to stay with them day and night. And it goes back, and I think that's how God, why he refers to us as sheep. And, and he's referred to as our shepherd because we need to be watched over. We can't be just turned out into the field and turned out into the pasture because I can tell you if we're turned out on our own, we're going to fail we're going to fail big time. And then there's another uh, problem lurking around, and that's the devil, the enemy. The Bible tells us that he's like a, a roaring lion. He's lurking around, or even like a wolf. He's in sheep's place. He's looking around and looking for an opportunity to, to come in and to wreak havoc to our, to our lives and to, to put doubt in our mind where we he can say, where's your God now? We're in this dark time. We're in this tough, troublesome time. We're in this sad time, and where is your God? He wants it for you to think that God has forsaken you. In Hebrews, in chapter 13, verse 5, uh, it says, Let your conversation be without covetous, and be content with such things as you have. And boy, there, there are strong statements there. Be without covetous, and be content with such things as we have. And I think we could, I could go off on a tangent here and, and preach a whole message about contentment and, and being content where we're at. But here in this case, many times God's pointing out to us and tell us even though we're in those dark times, when we're in those valleys and these sad times, that he wants us to be content in those times as well. Because he goes on and he says, For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor will I ever forsake thee. Amen. And many times uh, we've heard those expressions, this God-forsaken place, or this God-forsaken land, or this God-forsaken country. And I've even heard people say, Boy, God has forsaken America. God has forsaken our nation. I can tell you, you, you've got it totally wrong. If anything has happened, we have forsaken God. That's what happened. That's why the blessings don't seem to be coming out like they used to because we are a nation that condones sin. We are a nation that allows millions of babies to be murdered each and every year. And we put a, a stamp on it of approval and say that it's legal. Each and every time that the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage is challenged, we as a nation, we as a country are forsaking God. He's not forsaking us. He goes on in, in the book of Hebrews, and it talks about how good of a shepherd he is. You know, we don't just need any old shepherd. I could, I could get a, a flock of sheep and go out here and, and try to protect them and take care of them and care for them. Probably something's going to happen to many of them, but we need the great shepherd. The one who's referred to in Hebrews 13, verse 20, it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now we could, could, could pause there. What strong words these are. The God of peace. Even in these sad times that we're in. Even in these tough times. He is the God of peace. Amen. He's the God of peace. And he's the one we need to turn to. But it says. He that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. It says that great shepherd of the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. 
So I'll ask you this question. Have you ever in a time right now where you think that you feel forsaken? Go back to these words and know that God will not forsake us. There may be a question I need to follow up with that if you feel forsaken. Are you in God's will? Are we in God's will? Are we in the will of God? We talked about that a little bit this morning in Sunday school. And I love how God reaffirms some of those Sunday school messages with my message. And I didn't, didn't I'll, I'll admit I hadn't looked ahead to the Sunday school lesson this week. But he tells us there uh, that he will never leave us nor he will forsake us. And many times it's because we're not in his will. We're not seeking his will. We're trying to stand out on our own. We're trying to get out in our own field or in our own pasture and, and make it by ourselves. And we, we need the presence of God in our life each and every day. But it's even more important when we go through these sad times, these tragic times, these times of trouble. And you say, well, well here, how are you comparing the Bible? Well, Jesus in his earthly uh, life was in the saddest time of, of his life. Now, did God forsake him when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No, God did not forsake him because God already knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. He knew that he was going to go back to Hebrews 13, 20 and know that he's our great shepherd and that through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That, that everlasting covenant refers to this time on the cross when Jesus was there near his death and that blood that was shed was for you and I. So that goes into my, to my second thing. This situation with Christ was totally different. Now, last week I, I spoke about that great mystery between Mary and her son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I made a statement that the only one that does not have to accept the virgin birth by faith is Mary. Because she was the one that bore the Lord Jesus. She knew that she had not been with a man. She knew that that son that she carried was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But I believe even greater here is this mystery of what we see on the cross. The divine versus the human. God the Father and God the Son. Now, we all know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all one. The great three and one, the Trinity. That's what we believe. That's part of our faith statement. That's part of our mission statement. That's part of our bylaws. That's who we are as, as Christians in this church. But I can tell you that many times it's hard to explain and I'll give you a little background. Before I came to this church, you know, we were actively involved in our previous church, and we taught third through fifth graders for probably 10 years. And I can tell you some of the toughest questions I've ever had has been from third through fifth graders. Boy, they can, they can give you a tough question. And when they ask you, give you an answer, and I think, well, I'll give them the right answer. They'll say, well, why is that? Why? Wait a minute, I haven't even thought about that. What do you mean, why? You know, and you can't look at a third through fifth grader and say, well, because it's in the Bible, that's why. you got to give them some answers. But we hear those things about, you know, out of the mouth of babes, and it's true. And we need, to, we need to pay attention, and we need to acknowledge those. But I can tell you, I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. And it is hard to explain how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all one. How they were present, I believe the Bible tells us from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all three were present at creation. All three were present as Jesus died on the cross. But a little funny story about kids. Uh, I read this just the other week, and I got a kick out of it, and I put some on the back of the, of the bulletin uh, today, a little joke about trying to get young people in the church. But uh, this little girl was sitting on her granddaddy's lap, and she was looking up at her granddaddy with big eyes, and she was rubbing his, his face. And she looked at him and she said, Granddaddy, did God create you? And he said, well, yes, honey, he did a long, long time ago, but he created me. And then she looked down at her arm and she rubbed her arm, her hand, and she said, well, did God create me? And he said, well, yes, honey, he did. He created you, but just not too long ago. And she looked up at her granddaddy and she said, boy, he's getting better at this thing, ain't he? <laughs> so, you know, but it's the truth. We, in, in kids' minds, they, they don't fathom the things that we do or the things that we know. But we need to always be aware that we're many times just like these kids. We need to be seeking those questions. We need to be asking those questions, asking why, because I believe that God will show it to us. But here, this, this situation on the cross is totally different because in a physical sense, God did have to forsake his son. He had to turn his back on his son because of this everlasting covenant that had been made because the only way that you and I can have forgiveness of sins is if, if this happened on the cross. Now, was God able to rescue and pull his son off the cross? Absolutely. 
he was absolutely able to do so. There's a verse in the Bible uh, that talks about he could have called uh, 12 legions or 10,000 angels to have rescued Christ from the cross, and he could have done it. But if he would have done that, you and I would still be in that lost condition without the divine sacrifice, without the pure sacrifice, without the one uh, that shed his blood for our sins. And it shows us here how great a sacrifice it was. Our great shepherd had to bring the great sacrifice. Now, you might say, well, preacher, you don't know any other verses besides John 3, 16, because you quote that every time you preach. Well, y'all better get used to it, because I can tell you, again, it's not that verse is not just for kids. It's the gospel message all summed up in one. And it shows us right there in John 3, 16, how good a great sacrifice this was. How hard it was for God to look at his son on the cross and have to turn his back on him and forsake him when he said, For God so loved the world. That's us, all of us that are sitting here today. All of, anybody sitting in the parking lot, anybody in the entire world, God loved him so much that he gave his only begotten son, that he had to turn his back on his son while he was there suffering, when he was in this physical state of almost passing out, knowing that, that the agony and the pain that he was in, that he still gave his only begotten son. That's how great a sacrifice it was. And we, we think about loss and we think about all these things, but I tell you, it, it doesn't compare to what was seen there and what was done there. Yeah. We can go back and, and many of us are dealing with things. and You know, we think about maybe a, a loved one who is terminally ill or someone who is uh, going through tragedy. But you think about this, and I'll give you just a little bit of a, an analogy, how God looked down at his son on the cross and had to say, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you this time. Now, he knew, again, that it was going to be fulfilled, that he'd be raised again on the third day. But imagine that my son has came down with a, a disease and that I have the keys or I have the cure for that disease. I have the vaccine for, for COVID or I have the cure for cancer. I have the, the cure for him. But in order for me to, to help him, I'm going to let everybody else down. And I look at my physical self and I can probably tell you I'm going to let everybody down because of the love I have for my son and I'm going to provide for him. But look, how much of a great sacrifice was it from our great shepherd that he had it? He had the keys. He had the ability at that physical time to say, I've had enough. The people don't deserve my son to go through this pain and suffering, my only begotten son. But that's how great a sacrifice it was. In Revelation, it talks about it. Mike read it last week in chapter 1. He said, I am he that liveth, and he and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Talking about Jesus on the cross. He's the one that lived and walked on this earth. And he said, I'm the one that was dead, the one that you buried and put in the tomb. He said, I'm alive forevermore. And he says, I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. So not only did he have the ability to pull his son off the cross, the reason why he didn't is because those keys that he had, that ability he has, is what saved us from death and hell. He said he has the keys to death and hell. And I can tell you, if you don't have that key today, you need it. You need to make sure that you have that relationship with the Lord, that you've been saved, because this is a great sacrifice that we've given. So we can see how people say, well, we'll use this. Some of the liberals and, and different uh, liberal preachers will say, well, or Christians will say, well, how did God forsake his only son? He didn't. He didn't. He had to for us. He knew that he had the keys to death and hell, and that's why that he allowed this to happen. So we see that, first of all, God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Amen. And then we see that the situation with Christ was different. Even though from the outward appearance it, it may appear that he was forsaken, he was not. And then this instance with Christ. Even though Christ cried out uh, on this cross and said, My Father, my Father, why have thou forsaken me? He, too, also knew that it was his duty. And he knew that, that what he had to do was go to that cross and die. And then the third point is this. We must remain faithful no matter what the cost is. We must remain faithful no matter what the cost cost. Our Christian service does come at a cost. Some of you may have uh, experienced some form of persecution. And I've said it before, we didn't have anybody standing in the parking lot protesting or throwing rocks at us, keeping us out of church. But you may have family or friends that curl their nose up and look down at you for why why in the world are you going to church? Boy, our community has just suffered a, a tragic situation. How could God allow something like this to happen? Yet you're going to go to the house of God on Sunday morning. You're going to worship God. Yes, I am. Because I know that God never leaves me, nor will he forsake me. 
And I know the family that has lost their loved one this past week, God has never left them or forsaken them either. If you don't doubt, how can you say that? If you was at the funeral service or watched it, you could say the same thing. My what faith of a, of a family shows that the Christian love that they have. But it comes at a cost. I could go through the Word of God and I could show you Bible character after Bible character that paid an awful cost other than Christ. John the Baptist is one that comes to mind. He was the forerunner of Christ. He's the one that came to prepare the way for Christ. And John the Baptist stood firm against sin. Now, all he had to do was turn his blind eye. All he had to do was keep his mouth shut. And you know, many times uh, I suffer from that problem as well. I can't keep my mouth shut. Rachel's back there in the sound booth, shouting, hollering, amen, clapping. But you know, sometimes it's hard to do. And that, that comes, I'm telling you though, uh, it depends on the situation. When we're standing for God, we need to open our mouth up and, and let our mouth go. But sometimes when we want to say negative and bad things, that's when we have to, to, to hold it back. But John the Baptist knew that Herodias had been in, in a, uh, an affair. She was committing sin and committing adultery. And he called her out on it. And she didn't like him. That's why she asked for him to be executed. And it cost him his life. He could have easily kept his mouth shut and went on. Now you and I could have, could have, sometimes when you see a situation where somebody might be talking about abortion or the sanctity of marriage and different things, we could sit there and, and keep our mouth quiet. But I don't believe God wants us to do that. He wants us to stand firm for Him. We're not out to pick fights and pick arguments, but we're to stand firm for God. Amen. Many throughout the, the Christian life as well, uh, in our songbooks, you can turn in the songbooks we have today. And Fanny Crosby was a songwriter, probably more songs in this hymn book we have than anybody else that wrote them when she was blind. It had many different trials and troubles throughout her life, yet God used her in that great way. She could have given up. She could have said, God's forsaken me. I've got all these great things in my mind. I've got all these words in my mind, but I can't see to write them down. But yet she didn't give up. She kept pressing on. And then I've got in my notes here uh, the story about William Borden. Now, anybody go to the refrigerator and get home and check out, see if you got any cheese in there that says Borden cheese. Anybody ever eat any Borden cheese? That's right. And uh, it's been around for a long, long time. But the heir to that fortune was a man by the name of William Borden. And he was a, he wanted to be a missionary. He didn't want to be a cheesemaker. I can't say that I blame him. Somebody asked him, what do you do for a living? I'm a cheesemaker. It doesn't sound very good, but it's nothing wrong with anybody here's a cheesemaker. I like to eat cheese. But hey, he, William Borden was the heir to this fortune. In the early 1900s, billions and billions of dollars. To then, I mean, I don't know what that would even uh, equal out to today. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be uh, a missionary. He wanted to go on the mission field. He went and he studied hard. He went to, to college and he studied different languages and, and different things so he could be the best missionary that he could be. And before he was going to be deployed on the mission field, he had one more stop to make to learn one more language so he could reach the people that he was going to. But he contracted meningitis and he died. And you might look back at that story and say, well, God forsook him. He, he wanted to go to the mission field. But we can look back, if you read the story, I don't have time to tell you every detail about it, but he made an impact in people's life without even touching the mission field. God used him in a way that he would have him to be used. So our Christian service does come with a cost. It comes with a cost. But I can tell you that the cost is well worth it. It's well worth it. And we need to remain faithful. In 1 John it tells us this. says if we, all of us here today, confess our sins, that he, meaning God, meaning Jesus Christ, the one that died on the cross, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Now when you say, why is that so important? Because I, it's nothing that I can do. It's nothing. I can't cleanse you of your sin and, and make you righteous. Only God can do that. Only the, the price that was paid on the cross. No, no Catholic priest can do it. The Pope is making a tour all through our rock right now. I'm glad he's there. But he can't do it. Amen. We can confess our, our sins to man and it's falling on deaf ear. We need to confess our sins to God. And he's the one who's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And how? Because of this, this cost that he paid. This cost that he paid that none of us could ever even imagine or come close to going through. And then... In Proverbs, it tells us this, a faithful man who can find. So even though all throughout the Word of God, he's instructing us to be faithful and to remain faithful, we still look around sometimes and say a faithful man, or you could put in there a faithful woman who can find. Because many times, it is hard. I'm thankful today for the, for this church that he's 
place me in. I'm thankful for the many faithful people that are here. And I, I appreciate each and every one of you. We know that, that our Christian service will come at a cost. There will come a time when the church may be challenged for something that we do. Or individuals within the church may be challenged. But in, when those times comes, we need to know that God's not forsaken us. He's still right there with us. Even though we don't understand, even though the pasture don't look as green as what we'd like for it to look, he's still right there with us. And we know that, that our Christian service comes at a cost. And then the last thing I want to bring out to you today is this. Should we ask why? Should we ask why? And I'll give you this. I think even for us as Christians who have a strong faith and belief in God in our toughest times in our life, I think it's next to impossible for us not to ask why. Here, as I said, Christ in his physical sense turned to his father and asked why. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, many times we'll ask why for the wrong reasons. And I'll get to this here in a minute about the difference between asking why and the difference in questioning God. But many times, now you might be able to relate to this, we pull up out here to McDonald's and we order our stuff that we want and we decided we wanted an uh, ice cream cone or a milkshake. And then they look at you, come back over that speaker and say, Susie, don't get offended, I know you used to work at McDonald's. <laughs> hey, she managed how many McDonald's? But listen, I'm sure your ice cream machines were never broke. You need to, you need to go out here to Lou Ray and straighten them out. The one out there is always broke. They just need to take it off the menu. And then sometimes we say, Lord, I really wanted ice cream, but why does this ice cream machine have to be broke? Now, I don't think we need to question God over that or ask him why. You know, a lot of times, you ladies might go out and get your uh, manicures or pedicures. I get the fingers and the toes, which, the, whichever one you call them. I don't know which one it is, confused. But then you come back and you spend all that money on those things, and then you break a nail. You say, my God, why has you caused this? I just spent 40 bucks on these things, and I've got to chip one of them. And then, me and it's, it's us too, we might go through and forget our wife's birthday or anniversary. And we want to blame it on God. We might say, well, God, how did you let me forget my wife's birthday or her anniversary? That's not God's problem. That's yours. All these things, this is, this is meaningless to God. Ice cream and nails. But when we are in these deep, dark times of our life, I think it's, it's nearly impossible not to ask why. Jesus, we see here, he asked why. He asked why. And then we see all throughout Job, throughout his troubles and trials, he asked why. And, you know, we've got an advantage when we read about Job because we know the end of the story. And we've got an advantage here, too, because we can flip back to the book of Revelation where Mike has just started to read on Sunday morning, and, and we have the answer as well. We know that Christ is victorious. We know he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. And we know that no matter what we go through, that we might seem forsaken, that Christ is still there with us. Job did not know the conversation that God and the devil would have. He did not know that God agreed that he could be tempted, that his health could be challenged, that his wealth could be challenged, but God told the devil, you can't have his life. But Job didn't know that. He didn't know the outcome. And he went through all those things, and, and, a, and a faithful man, Job was. A man of God, a man after God's own heart, but yet he still asked why. And then Moses, he asked God why. Why have you chosen me? There's others that are more qualified. I've asked that same question. When, when God called me into the ministry, I thought, there's no way. This has got to be, I'm not, it's not the Holy Spirit speaking to me, it's something else. For years, people would say, oh, the, Lord's, the Lord wants you to, to go and, and preach. And I'm like, well, I'm glad he's told you that because he hadn't told me that. But here, Moses cries out, we know how God used Moses. And he asked God, why? There's better people than me. But there's a difference in asking why. Why, Lord, am I going through this? Why, Lord, do I have to experience these things than question the Lord? Many times when I said that, you know, people will say, well, how can your God let such bad things happen? How can your God let such a tragedy that's happened to our community happen? That's, that's not asking God why. That's questioning God. That's questioning his authority. That's questioning his word. When we pick and choose and we read through the Bible and say, oh, this is easy to follow. You know, I can do this. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. I can do that. I love God. But then when it says, love your neighbor and love your enemy, boy, it starts to get a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult. But we're not to question God. We can say, God, you know, I don't truly understand how you want me to do this, but I want you to show me how I can do it. So there, we can see that it's impossible not to ask why. 
if we went through this situation that our community has went through and we didn't ask why, I, I applaud you. Your faith is, is 10 times stronger than mine because many times throughout these past over a week, I've asked why. Why, Lord? And we won't know. But I'm thankful that one day we will know. I'm thankful that we will be able to know. And the only way that we'll be able to know is because God looked down at his son and had to turn his back on him. He had to forsake his son because he knew that it was the only way that we would be able to have salvation. The only way that we'd be able to be with Christ forever and be forgiven of our sins. So today I, I pointed out these four things. And I want to challenge your heart today that I don't know where, where you're at with your walk with the Lord. And I can tell you that, I, that all of us are going to go through trials and challenges and adversities. And we need to cling to these words. We need to look to, to God as he looked at his son on the cross and know that he's there with us. That he'll never leave us nor will he ever forsake us. And know that it will come at a cost. There will be a cost to our Christian life. There's, there's preachers that preach a, what I call a prosperity gospel. They want you, they say, oh, if you accept Christ as your Savior, your life's going to be perfect. Most of those preachers have got a lot of hair and got a much prettier smile than I do. And uh, maybe that's why they believe it. People believe it. I don't know. Maybe if I had more hair, you might pay more attention to me. But listen, it comes at a great cost, okay? And just because we accept Christ, I will be doing not my diligence today to the Lord to tell you, if you come and accept Christ today, that your life will be perfect. He'll never, I can promise you from his word that he'll never leave you, forsake you, but I can't promise you that your life's going to be a bed of roses from that day forward. But I can assure you by God's word, not by mine, that he'll be there for you. He'll never leave you or he'll forsake you even when it comes at a great cost. And then if you're in that point in time and you've asked God why, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Keep praying. Keep praying and God will reveal it to you. He'll show it to you. The Holy Spirit will speak to you somehow, some way. And he'll be able to speak to your heart that the Lord uh, would allow you to know why I was going on. So today, I, I pray it's been a blessing to you. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, to bow your heads and close your eyes. We'll pray and close our service out. And then we'll have our uh, hymn of invitation, our closing hymn.